So, um, obviously France is eager to get revenge on England as a result of their losses from the French and Indian War. They had been secretly supplying the Americans throughout much of the war. All right, sounds good. See you later. Have a good one. Um, so what the Continental Congress is going to do is send delegates to France. Um, Franklin is sent over as the, the, as the minister to France. Adams will join him later, as will Jefferson. Adams will be, be, then be moved on to Holland. And then from Holland, Adams will become our first minister to Great Britain following the um, victory in the revolution. So what we're looking for, they're looking for a model treaty where they can keep, you know, they can keep a, a chain of supply and commerce going. Ben Franklin's going to play on the, on the American rugged individualism or spirit of the patriot by wearing like simple clothes, coonskin cap, he's going around selling American flags like the one you see over here with the uh, 13 stars. Um, so again, after the humiliation of Saratoga, Britain wants to try to shore up peace by providing essentially what we would call it provincial um, recognition of the colonies, but not full on independence. This is where King Louis the 16th, same guy, that you've learned about who lost his head in the French Revolution at the advice of his ministers and foreign advisors will agree that this is probably the time to strike because the British are vulnerable and the Americans need them. So after Saratoga, France will be persuaded to enter the war mainly by Benjamin Franklin. Why do you think Franklin's such an, an important, sort of easy diplomat to try to negotiate a strategy? You know, help me out with that? Yeah. Very intelligent, okay? So if he's intelligent, he likely speaks what? He does. That's tremendously important to the French. In fact, that's one problem Adams had. Adams didn't speak French, and Louis was offended that that Adams did not speak French. And that's a big reason that Adams will wind up with the Dutch and will ultimately end up in England. Um, all right, uh, what's another reason why Ben Franklin's gonna be a, a, a pretty important diplomat here? Okay, that guy kind of goes back to him as being sort of a Renaissance man, which I'm glad you brought that up because he is an international rock star. He is internationally famous. So it's kind of like they've got not just a intelligent diplomat who speaks language, they have a celebrity, right? So that sort of that's a big deal. And it's an easy way to remember this too. He's one of he's one of only a few or two Americans with their statue in Paris. You know who the other one is? That's a good guess, but no. Washington. Franklin and Washington. Kind of interesting that, that Jefferson's not there. Another guy I'm surprised never made his way into Paris his first statue is Eisenhower after the liberation of France. But that's a different story for another time. Um, later, next semester. Um, all right. So, the 1778 Treaty of Alliance will officially bring France onto our side. And France will definitely tip the balance of the war, providing somewhere around 70% supply in terms of ammunition and military supply, and like 90% of the naval backing um, after their, their entry. Here we have Ben Franklin uh, in France. Now the colonial war with the entry of France has become a wider war, a larger war. Holland and Spain will come in on the side of England. Catherine the Great of Russia will declare neutrality staying out of the war, which obviously helps the, helps the Americans. Um, 
Most of Spain and Holland support will be financial, and that's going to have some implications for the Treaty of Paris because they're going to have to pay uh, these loans back. There's going to be war debt that will follow that will be owed to the Dutch, the Spanish, and the French. Um, France is now on the open seas. They're mobilizing a French force uh, led by Rochambeau um, and a naval force led by uh, the, the Grouse. I need to know that. Uh, she had. She just took off of it. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> uh, with the French coming into the war, this leads the British to want to evacuate Philadelphia and focus their forces on New York, um, which they already had they, they held, right? So this leads to what I would consider a turning point uh, in terms of morale. Uh, the Patriot Continental Army, led by Washington, will lead an attack on Sir Henry Clinton and his forces from the rear at Monmouth, New Jersey on June 28, 1778. It's a blistering hot summer day, and even though the battle's a draw, um, it's a moral victory for the Patriot Army, and it also frees up Philadelphia back to the, to the um, Patriot side. Do keep in mind, wars aren't won without women, mothers, daughters, and sisters win wars. Um, some of the important women that come from the, come out of the Revolutionary Era, we have Deborah Samson, who disguised herself as a male soldier under the name Robert Shirtliff. Molly Pitcher, who took up her husband's artillery detail on the battlefield at Monmouth, <coughs> also gave dehydrated and uh, soldiers suffering from exhaustion and heat stroke, water, much needed water on the battlefield. Uh, speaking of our American flag, uh, we should also mention a really important founding mother, and that being um, Betsy Ross. Also, our founding mothers like Abigail Adams are gonna play an important role. Uh, Martha Dandridge Custis, Washington's uh, wife, uh, Martha Washington, um, among other founding mothers during the war. So a shout out to the ladies and a shout out to the founding mothers, daughters, sisters. Uh, Deborah Sampson on the left here, the legend of Molly Pitcher on the right, the Battle of Monmouth, taking up the artillery detail. There's going to be a focus now on moving the war and establishing a major campaign in the South. And the idea is for the, the British to roll up the colonies from south to north and attempt to um, essentially win the war by victory from, from south to north. This particular army, uh, British Army, will be led by Lord Charles Cornwallis. The Patriot Army in the south was led by Horatio Gates. Um, he's going to lose that command because Gates is the guy that accepted we're going to surrender um, at Saratoga. The French commander Rochambeau will uh, reinforce Washington's army that's still located in the middle Atlantic. Um, and there's some tension that occurs between the, the Patriots and the French. But uh, again, despite those flare-ups, um, cooler heads prevail. You got guys like Lafayette who have risen to a higher rank in Washington's army to help uh, navigate those um, those little battles over over um, ego and and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word I want to put here. Not just egos, but also uh, the right military strategy and tactic moving forward. You have to realize a lot of the Continental Army commanders. They might not be as well trained as the French, but they've been fighting this war for a longer period of time, and they aren't necessarily up for um, the, you know, all the strategy and, and military expertise that the French bring 
from other wars. Um, so th that leads to some headbutting. The French will arrive in Newport, Rhode Island in 1780, providing ground, ground troops. Um, tragically, in 1780, uh, feeling underappreciated and lured by gold and command of the British ar Army, Benedict Arnold will unsuccessfully try to hand over the uh, fort at West Point on the Hudson to the British, but the plot will be foiled. Uh, spy, spies will be captured um, and will be hanged. Arnold gets away, ends up with the British command, and ends up launching some attacks, as I mentioned before, um, here in Virginia um, on, the, on the Patriots toward the end of the war. And again, by the end of the war, he's sort of seen as like kind of a man without a country. Um, the British devised this plan to roll up the South. Georgia is overrun by the British in 1778-79. Charlestown, now Charleston, South Carolina, fell in 1780. But do keep in mind that the Patriots will fight bitterly to hold southern states in, in southern strongholds. They'll battle their loyalist neighbors. A uh, turning point battle on the border of North Carolina and South Carolina and Appalachia is the Battle of Kings Mountain. If you ever have an opportunity to go to this location, it's pretty incredible. Um, just get an idea of the brutal terrain that the uh, Patriots and the British were fighting on. It was like, you know, steep mountains in, uh, in, the Appal in Appalachia on the border of North and South Carolina on October 7, 1780. Um, is it a really important strategic victory? Eh, not really. It's more of a massive moral victory. Um, General Daniel Morgan defeats British forces at Cowpens. That's, he's the same guy that led the sharpshooters at Saratoga. The Carolina campaign also leads to the rise of a uh, pretty distinguished general. Quaker raised and brilliant tactician, General Nathaniel Green. He actually ends up taking over Horatio Gates' army after the Patriot defeat at Camden. But do keep in mind that the grind of this war uh, and the grind of, the, of this Southern campaign lead to the celebrity of, of three major generals, Green, Nathaniel Green, Daniel Morgan, and Francis Marion. Swamp Fox. Anybody ever seen the film The Patriot before? Familiar? So those are like the tactics that these guys used in the in the uh, these Patriots used in the South um, during the war. You do realize the Patriots like historical fiction, right? It's not, you know, Mel Gibson's character is not real, but some of those some of the the strategies that were used in that film were. Here we have an image of the Battle of Calpins. All right, the war is also on the frontier, what we would call Trans-Appalachia. Um, this is a really brutal area of fighting. Um, on the frontier, 1777 was known as the Bloody Year. This is where the Indians uh, were paid for, um, paid by the British for Patriot scalps. <laughs> Um, all right, so moving right along, uh, most of the Indians supported uh, the British. Um, Mohawk chief Joseph Bryant converted to the Anglican faith, and he actually attacked Patriot, um, Patriot Continental Army soldiers in the back country of Pennsylvania, New York, till he was checked. I want you guys to take note of 1784. Note that I put, uh, that's not a typo. It is a year after the Treaty of Paris. What you'll notice is that the first treaty signed with Native Americans between the United States government and Native American tribes is the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. Um, and under the terms, Native tribes ceded their land, and 
pioneers continued to move west. Also, I wanted to point out how the Iroquois were broken up during the war. The Oneida and the Tuscarora fought with the colonists or the American patriots, and on the other side, the British side, the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, and, and um, Seneca fought with the British. George Rogers Clark, he's a brother of another famous Clark you already know. Who's that? What Clark do you know from this era? William? Yeah. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Yeah. George Rogers Clark is William Clark's brother. He is a frontier settle, uh, settler, sort of frontiersman fighter. He and a detachment of 175 men float down the Ohio to take Kaskaskia, Cahokia, um, Vincennes, all along the Ohio and into the Mississippi River Valley. And there's in Vincennes, uh, Indiana, there's a stat or not a statue, but it's a it's like a I'm trying to think of it. It's like a rotunda in his honor. Um, Little American Navy. They had a really hard time with the British warships. Did you know that they attempted submarine warfare? It didn't really work out. The turtle. Um, the idea was it's like a bicycle bicycle propeller, like guys in there pedaling, the propeller's going, and on the end of a rod is a bomb or a keg of, of um, either a cannonball or a keg of gunpowder, but what do you think the biggest problem was with the turtle? Yeah. You didn't have the air to make it, right? So they, they, the turtle kept sinking. So that was a big problem. So they abandoned the submarine warfare. Um, they did give British shipping uh, a huge problem. And this war actually went as far south as the Caribbean and as far east as the British Isles. The commander of the Continental Navy was John Paul Jones. He was commander of the Ranger. They famously said, I have not yet begun to fight. Now, you do realize he's not the namesake of the arena at UVA. Just to be clear. But to confuse you, there are paintings of his and quotes of his in the arena. Um, yeah, he, got, he actually ends up going on to serve with the Russian Imperial Navy, rises to the rank of rear admiral, dies in Paris. But he's buried in America. Any ideas where he's buried? John Paul Jones. Jamestown, good guess, but no. Nope. He's buried in Annapolis. Why do you think he's buried? Why do you think John Paul Jones is buried in Annapolis? Any ideas? Does anybody know what prestigious college is in Annapolis? It was founded in the 1840s. Yeah. The United States Naval Academy. He's buried at the Naval Academy. Get it? That makes sense? All right. Uh, hang in there with me, guys. Hang in there. Jones commanded the Rangers, Swift privateers, preyed on enemy shipping throughout the war. Um, the Patriots outspied the British. The most notable group was the Culper Ring that spied in and around New York. And it was basically a group of double agents who were doubling as what? Loyalists. Who said that? Nice job. Well done. Great work. All right. On the left, George Rogers Clark. In the center, John Paul Jones. And on the right, Benjamin Talmadge, leader of the Culper Ring. And what famous artist 
defeated all three of these. Charles Wilson Peel. Very good. What? <laughs> I also provided you a kind of a cool map that shows you the route of the Culper Ring to get information to Washington. All right. Here we go. Wrapping things up. Yorktown, Yorktown in the final curtain. Before the last decisive victory, inflation was on the rise. Listen up. Continental money was absolutely worthless. Folks, thank you. Continental Army and the Continental Government were bankrupt. They did adopt the Articles of Confederation, which we're going to talk about in Lesson 7, but they purposely made it weak, and it failed due to those weaknesses of a lack of common currency, a lack of strong central government, too much power in the states, no judiciary, no executive branch. We'll get into that a bit later. Lord Cornwallis, the southern British commander, was coaxed into a trap on the Yorktown Peninsula. Why do you think, why do you all think that uh, Cornwallis would have thought it would have been smart to take up position on the peninsula? Any idea? Yeah. Yes, that's it. He's got easy access to get where he needs to go and to get supply. He's not prepared for a French blockade, right? And he's not prepared to add Washington and Rochambeau and the other uh, parts of the Continental Army surrounded. Cornwallis will be surrounded on the peninsula. Guys, this is larger than a battle. It is a siege. It lasts for weeks, okay? The Patriots dug in. Guys, you can still go down to Yorktown and see the trenches that were dug by the Patriots in the siege of Yorktown. Those very trenches were used in the American Civil War between the U.S. forces and Confederate forces in the Peninsula Campaign. All right? Rochambeau and Washington's army make a daring move to cut, cut off uh, Cornwallis. De Grasse's Navy will, will uh, establish a blockade, and Cornwallis will be forced to surrender on, um, uh, in 1781. So again, what this ultimately leads to is the largest standing army now. You had Burgoyne's army. Now today, the largest standing army October 19, 1781, Cornwallis' army surrenders. Cornwallis refused to surrender. Okay? Therefore, Washington refused to accept his surrender from an aide. So two military aides met on the field. Do you all remember who Washington's aide de camp was? You guys probably loved or maybe you're a fan of this series or show on Broadway or what? Oh, Any Hamilton fans? Yeah. Hamilton, Hamilton was one of Washington's right hand men and the military in the Revolutionary War. Okay. He's in Paris. Americans that brokered the, the Treaty of Paris met Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. John Jay suspected that France would try to keep the United States cooped up east, so he demanded that we get everything to what river? He demanded that the United States stretch to what river? Farther, farther west than that. Very good. The Mississippi River Valley. So this is going to be a pretty big deal for the, for the Patriots, okay? Through the Treaty of Paris, the revolution officially ends. America is recognized as an independent nation. Spain gets back what land it had lost previously. I told you I'd mention this again. What land did they lose after the French and Indian War? 
Florida, very good. France gets back Louisiana, and America gets everything to the Mississippi River. Loyalists do not get back their private property they lost. That's why most loyalists end up either in Canada or in Britain. And Washington will disband the Continental Army at France's Tavern in New York City, December of 1783. I'd like everybody to take a look at this painting. Why is the painting not finished? No. It's a group of people that do not want to be involved in this painting. Very good. The British will not be involved in this painting because the British are in attendance at the Treaty of Paris as well. So you're missing the British likeness. You have the American diplomats on the left and the French diplomats in the center. And then this is the tearful goodbye, Washington's farewell, the Continental Army. This is the reason, and this is what I, the last thing I want us to, I want to bring up. This is why we call Washington the American Cincinnatus, the American citizen soldier. Because what does he want his army to go do? He wants them to go home and live their lives, right? So where does Washington return to live his life? Mount Vernon. Very good. All right.